there were four cases among your readings called KW, DRH, RW, and Crandall. And I summarized them for you. I posted it on here. I sent you emails, and I told you, although I didn't have to do any of this, you were supposed to read these. What I did was I gave you a summary of them because some of this was on the midterm. I think one question. <laughs> so the point is I wanted you to understand it and learn it. I've done so much about the midterm, and I gave you a link up here, which um, when you clicked on it, it should take you to the... Um, uh, YouTube page. Let's see. Well, we can close this. And it should play from right where I gave a similar lecture on these four cases um, in 2012, I think. Uh, the link didn't work as expected, but it should have started like somewhere over there. Now, what I want to do is um, just mention these one more time. Each one of these had something to do with the Sixth Amendment. I was talking over and over again about the Sixth Amendment, and that was something that applied in, in Ray Call, right? The lady didn't come to testify about the obscene phone call, so he had a Sixth Amendment problem, the right to confront the witnesses. And when we look at how children get justice in our courts, we have changed the rules a little bit to favor kids. And defense lawyers have said, wait a minute, man. You have impacted our Sixth Amendment right to confrontation. Fortunately for the children, the courts have consistently allowed the rules and procedures to be relaxed just a little bit so that they can get a fair shake in the criminal courts, even if it impacted on the right to confront the witnesses, even if it impacted upon the Sixth Amendment of the, the, the accused. And all of these cases speak to that. Now, one of the things I like here is there's a um, video clip I put here from a movie from the time of King Henry VIII in the <laughs> Middle Ages, okay? And, and I told you that we had a bad experience in England. Uh, they could put troops in our homes. They could uh, drag us out without telling us the charges. They can prosecute us without an attorney. Um, this is a good example of how the system worked in England, where in this case, this was the Henry's wife, this was the Queen of England, that she was charged with offenses um, uh, that um, she never was able to defend herself against. And uh, there are tremendous Sixth Amendment problems here, which she identifies rather clearly. Um, although they didn't have a Sixth Amendment there. So she's on trial um, in the English courts. Lost the Kingston, bring in the prisoner. day when the nobility of a country does not stand for its queen. Even so, when that same queen is charged with adultery and incest. This charge is different from convicted, Master Cromwell. For is it not in this court? year of the reign of our sovereign lord Henry, King of England, his wife, Queen, having been seduced by the devil, did knowingly commit adultery. How do you plead? Not guilty, my lord. Well, one thing they, they got right is the 14th Amendment. They gave her notice of the charges, okay, and that's good. You didn't even get that engulfed in America many years later. So she gets notice of the charges, so that, that part's good. Further, as queen, 
I challenge the right for the court to try me at all. So now she's making a jurisdictional argument. She says that the tribunal, this court, has no jurisdiction over her for a very interesting reason. On what grounds? They're not my equals. I caution her majesty against such arrogance when we have a mountain of evidence against her. Correction. A mountain of lies. I have countless statements from witnesses sworn under oath. Well, then either these people have perjured themselves or you obtained your statements with the black and irons. Does the queen presume to call me a liar? Well, a greater justification than you call me or. My gosh. Why do we tolerate such disrespect? I have here a hundred pages of confession that show the Queen has committed fornication, high treason, and matters of a sexual nature so offensive to God. Well, then can we not read these statements? And where are these witnesses? Are they not present so we can hear them for ourselves? They're condemned. We will not insult his majesty by admitting their evidence in his court. Why not? You insult him far more with the perversion of justice that is happening here in his name. I hardly think this queen is qualified to speak of perversion. <laughs> Silence. My noble lords, what I fear is true, namely that you have condemned me already. Well then my testimony is of no value. But allow me, for the sake of the record and my conscience, to say this. Okay. So you can see there they're talking about a mountain of evidence, and he throws down a bunch of sworn statements, they got beautiful ribbons on them, probably wax seals. But she never gets to hear who they are. In fact, she challenges them. Who are these people? Why don't they come here and say what they are? And then one of the members, I think that's her brother, actually, says uh, they're condemned, these people. They're not worthy of being in this court. Well, you're basing the prosecution on their statements in the one hand. On the other hand, you're saying that they're not even worthy to be heard. The point is, is that that's an example of someone being prosecuted without being able to confront the witnesses against them. And it may seem silly and it may seem overly dramatic, but that's the way it worked. You would be prosecuted based upon hearsay and based upon purported statements of witnesses without the opportunity to see who these, these mystery people were. And we don't prosecute cases like that anymore. Far from it. We have a constitutional amendment that protects us from such, con such prosecutions. In fact, it may not always be so obvious that the issues of the Sixth Amendment are involved. But they were in every one of those cases. For example, KAW. In KAW, the courts created special rules for kids when they had to remember dates for the criminal complaint or the indictment. Every indictment or criminal complaint, when someone's charged under our Constitution, you have to put the date that the thing happened. So you have to have notice. And I was joking around before that the one thing they got right in the trial of Anne Boleyn was they told her what the charges were. And that's true. Part of telling someone what the charges are involves telling them when it happened. So in child abuse cases, there's a problem. It's difficult for kids to remember exactly when something happened. So prosecutors were challenged in putting the dates in the indictment or in the complaint. And they could not be precise in many cases. So the defendants challenged the indictment, actually it was a juvenile complaint, in the KAW case. And they said, listen, unless the prosecutor can put specific dates, the indictment or the complaint has to be thrown out. 
Because if you don't tell me when something happened, you're taking away my right to confront the evidence against me. If I don't know when it happened, I cannot defend myself and build a case. This goes back to what happened to Anne Boleyn, essentially, that I cannot cross-examine or challenge because I'm not quite sure when this happened. The court said, well, the aim is to narrow the time frame. The prosecutor doesn't have to be specific. The deputy attorney general doesn't have to be specific. You can link up when it happened to maybe something that's memorable in the child's life, the birthday, the seasons of the year, when they lived in a particular house maybe, a death in the family, a change in routine. We often put down the summer of 2009, okay, uh, between September and December of 2012. You can put in the complaint a span of years or a span of time. And although it does have an impact upon the accused's Sixth Amendment right, it's not so significant that the child should have to have her complaint dismissed because she doesn't remember exactly when things happened. VRH is the medical exam case. That was the exam that was in um, referenced in your midterm examination, right? In VRH, the defendant wanted to get a second independent medical exam of the child. Anyway, in this case, the defendant said, if the government, and as your exam question said, if the prosecutor is going to put a medical report in that says the child has evidence of trauma that shows I penetrated her, in this case it's a penetration case, then I got a right to challenge that. Just like the queen had a right to challenge the witnesses against her, so she thought. And one way to challenge that is to say, listen, I want to get the child independently examined. I want to get my own examination of the child. Why should I rely solely on the prosecutor's evidence? Right? So, in essence, this is an, an expression of the defendant's right to challenge the witnesses against them. Because the state's going to put on their doctor. And their doctor's going to say, this kid has evidence of general trauma. And that evidence is consistent with the child's allegation. So he should go to jail. So the defendant says, I want to challenge this doctor. I want to be able to cross-examine this doctor. I want to be able to say that this doctor messed up or doesn't know what she's doing. I have a Sixth Amendment right to challenge the witnesses against me. And one way that I do that is to get my own examination. One way to do that is to do my own <laughs> examination of the child. Now, this is something that defendants have been able to do in all criminal prosecutions. For example, if it was a fingerprint case, and they found fingerprints at the scene, the defendant would be able to take the fingerprints, because they put a little powder on it, they make an image of it, and bring it to their own expert. Or if there was a shell casing, in cases where there was a weapon used, sometimes they're able to look at the shell casing from a bullet and determine whether it came out of a specific gun. right? So let's say the defendant got caught with a handgun, and in his car there was a shell casing. And we're saying that the shell casing came out of that handgun. We give the shell casing to an FBI expert. He looks at it and he says there's little markings on the shell casing that are consistent with the barrel of a gun. Because every gun barrel, when a bullet travels through that gun barrel, every gun barrel, the inside of it is a little bit different, like a snowflake. A little bit different in size. So there will be peculiar markings on the shell casing that I can conclude with confidence it came from this specific gun. The defendant says, so you're going to put an FBI guy against me on the witness stand? Yeah. And he's going to testify about the shell casing? Yeah. I want my guy to look at the shell casing. I want the shell casing. I want to take it to my own ballistics expert. Why? I want to confront the witness against me. I want to confront the FBI expert for the state who claims that this bullet came out of the gun. It's important to the prosecution to tie the bullet to the gun. I've got a right under the Sixth Amendment to challenge the witnesses against me. I want to challenge the FBI guy. The way I'm going to do it is get my own expert on bullets. Similarly, the child, right, the defendant wants to say the child needs to be examined again. Hey, I respect that you had your doctor look at her. And I respect that your doctor concluded that she has genital trauma. You're trying to tie that genital trauma to my guy, to this defendant. 
to this accused. I want to challenge that doctor. I want my own doctor to look at that child and do a medical exam and see if she sees the same kind of trauma. This is my Sixth Amendment right. The court said, thankfully, that the defendant does not have a right to a second independent medical exam. His Sixth Amendment right is involved, there's no doubt about it. Right? I mean, if he can't get his own expert to look at something that the government is offering in court, he's not able to fully <coughs> confront the witness against them. Well, the court said, in part, you don't have an absolute right to confront the witnesses. You don't have a right to perfect confrontation here. They don't shut the door completely. Right? They don't shut the door completely. They say, if there is a reason that you can show, right, if you can show that the evidence that you would be able to produce would contradict the prosecutors, then maybe we'll let you get that second exam. But you don't have an absolute right to it, and it's a very rare case where we'll give you a second independent exam. There's something that we use now when we conduct medical examinations of children that pretty much make DRH moot. You know what moot means? Moot means it's not important anymore. It's it was a big deal, but we don't need to worry about it anymore. It's moot. Excuse me. Can someone guess <coughs> or even know what we do differently when we examine children? When we do a medical genital evaluation of a child, what the doctors do? They not only look, but what else do you think they do nowadays? Excellent. What did you say? Well, they do take samples, but they also take pictures. And the way they take pictures is with a machine called a culposcope. Now, not everyone uses a culposcope. In fact, some forensic nurses and doctors don't even believe you need a culposcope anymore. They simply, you know, have the child in a particular position where you can get a clean line of sight for the genitalia, and they take photos with a digital camera. These digital cameras are very high resolution now. But a culposcope is just a digital camera that it's on an apparatus, and you wheel it in, and it's got an arm on it and it holds the camera steady so that the doctor doesn't have to worry about camera shape or anything like that. And if they use video, the child can watch the exam. Kind of like sometimes when the women um, are pregnant and they put the, what do you call that thing? Sonogram. sonogram. And you watch in real time the sonogram. Well, the child, if the doctor is using a video colposcope, can watch in real time the exam. And that might decrease the intensity a little bit, isn't it? You know, sometimes the kids like to talk about what they see and kind of has a calming effect on some kids. But what's important for our purposes is the video or the images are documented through digital photography now. So the defendant who says, I want my own doctor to examine this case, can get very high resolution pictures. And they can have their doctor look at it. And their doctor will go, wait a minute, I don't agree with that. That's not a notch. Okay, that's something that normally occurs in kids, right? So that's why it's, DRH is virtually moot. But at the time DRH was decided, I think it was in the 90s, the early 90s, at the time DRH was decided, it was a big issue, and the defense lawyers wanted to get the kids examined, and it, it hurt the case for the prosecution and for child protection a little bit, because the family didn't want to set a medical exam. I mean, the kid's been through enough, and the exam itself can be embarrassing and traumatic. Okay? And that's something that was difficult to go through the first time without having to have gone through it another time because the defendant wanted it done. RW was a case with a three and a half year old kid. Okay, and not a lot of emphasis on the Sixth Amendment, although it's involved. The defense wanted a medical, psychological exam of the child, simply because the child was little. RW stands for the proposition that you need more than simple immaturity to get a competency evaluation. Competency means the ability to remember stuff in the past and be able to tell in court about what you experienced in the past, as well as able to differentiate what's real from what's not real, what's fantastic from what's true. Okay. Now, most witnesses that walk through the courtroom door, we expect that they know the difference between the truth and a lie. We expect that they know what's fake and real. You know, We expect that people are competent. 
we expect that they can remember stuff and tell about what they remember. But some people who may have cognitive disabilities, they may have mental health issues, they may have been in an automobile accident, they may have brain damage, they may be all kinds of reasons why someone may not be able to be um, considered competent in a courtroom. And again, to be considered competent, you have to be able to, it seems simple, but some witnesses can't do it. You've got to be able to remember what happened in the past, to be able to tell about it now. <coughs> and you have to be able to differentiate between what's real and what's fake or imagined. And you have to be able to understand the obligation to tell the truth. Now, the defendant in the RW case said, wait a minute. This kid's three and a half years old. Oh, I don't believe this child's competent. I want a psychological evaluation of the child. I want a doctor to evaluate her, ask her questions, conduct tests, find out if she's competent. The court said, no, we're not going to do that. These cases are great because they all level the playing field. And they make the courtroom a more hospitable place for kids. If the defendants got what they wanted in all these cases, there would be significant barriers to justice for children. Okay? If they couldn't remember the dates, the courtroom door would be slammed shut and there would be no justice. Okay? If they had to get another medical exam because the prosecutor found some evidence, that kid may not go through with it and the case would be dismissed because they wouldn't go through with the medical exam because they were traumatized or afraid or scared or the family just lost respect for the process and didn't want to participate anymore. And they would not have gotten justice. In RW, there may be a psychological exam, and it may be ambiguous, or the parents may not want to go through the psychological exam, or the government may not be able to uh, have their own psychologist produce an exam. For a variety of reasons, it certainly had the capacity to slow down the case, okay, and reduce the potential for justice in the RW case. Well, the court said, no, everybody who walks into a courtroom, everyone, boys and girls, Men and women, tall people, short people, rotund people, skinny people. Every person that walks in the courtroom is presumed competent. They're presumed to know what the past is and be able to say what it is and to tell the difference between the truth and the lie. If you want a psyche valve, a witness, you have to show. You've got to come to court and say why. You've got to provide an articulable basis, okay? You've got to provide an articulable basis why you need a medical, uh, psychological exam of the child or the witness. And the court said, you have to show a substantial deviation from normal functioning. Okay? That's how the court expressed it. Now, that doesn't mean the defendant can never get a witness psychologically examined. Sure they can. There are examples of people who have mental health issues that they may not be competent. But you got to say what it is. Just because a kid's three and a half doesn't mean they're not competent. A child could very well be competent. you got to point to something else other than her youthful age. Now, Crandall was the case that you did your learning project on, and that involved a New Jersey state law, again, the Sixth Amendment, front and center, that permitted a child to testify remotely or in another location. The child did not have to be in the courtroom. The child, under certain circumstances, could testify from another location. Now, it could be an office, it could be a conference room, it could be a doctor's office. Some of these child advocacy centers have a special conference room where kids are supposed to go in order to testify remotely or on closed circuit television. But there's not an absolute right for a child to testify remotely. There has to be a showing. And the prosecutor has to show that the child could not testify because they were traumatized by who or what? By the defendant. By the defendant. Not the courtroom, not the funny doors, not the judge's funky black robe, not the fact that all kind of people are sitting in a box and you don't know them. All that stuff may have an impact on the child's level of functioning and their ability to testify, and it may be relevant, but it's not 
the issue, if you want to be successful in allowing that child to testify remotely on closed circuit television, there you have to show that the child is traumatized, that the quality of their, of their testimony will be significantly impacted by the presence of the defendant. It's the defendant who is the problem. Okay? So how does this involve the Sixth Amendment then? What does this have to do with Anne Boleyn on trial in the 15th century uh, and the pack of statements that are used against her? How does Crandall have anything to do with the Sixth Amendment right to confrontation? Who's the accused in the Crandall case? It's an, well, what is he? An adult, a man, a dad, right? Who's the father? It's the stepfather, right? He's accused of a crime, right? Of sexually molesting the child, right? So what does the Sixth Amendment guarantee Anne Boleyn and all of us? The right to do what? What? Face your accuser. Question, confront the witnesses against you. So what did that have to do with Crandall? Who's the accuser for the stepdad who's on trial? Child. Child. Right. What's the stepdad's argument? Is he able to confront his accuser? No. 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 We say yes, but he says no, right? The Supreme Court said, ultimately, that it doesn't violate the Sixth Amendment. What was his argument? What do you think your argument would be if you said, wait a minute, I'm not really confronting my witnesses against me. What would you argue? What was his argument? Why this wasn't really confrontation. Well, you can't question the videotape. You can't question the videotape, but it's not a videotape. The child's over there. She's just in another room. She's live on the TV. It would more likely that she would lie if she wasn't facing Well, it was more likely he would lie. Why would it be more likely? The child would lie, but what would make her more likely to lie? Why? Because she was in the other room. Somebody else in the room with her? No, nobody's coaching her. There's nobody in the room. Yeah, his argument was the right to confrontation is to be in the room, to look him in the eye. Do you see what he would argue is fundamentally missing here? You know, you have a kid who steals something from the cookie jar, right? <laughs> and, you know, he says, oh, I didn't steal anything from the cookie jar. My big brother did it. You think the big brother goes, I didn't take it. Bring little brother in. I want him to look me in the eye and say that. There's something meaningful about looking somebody in the flesh and blood in the eye. Go ahead. What did I do? The Sixth Amendment guarantees that the person be confronted. And the defendant argued that confrontation involves face to face, not in some other room. And as you suggested, that the, the likelihood of the child lying or not being candid is enhanced. Or more likely, the defendant argued. Because she doesn't have to look at the guy. You see? It's not only his ability to question her, but she should have to look at him when she's making the accusation. Because it's hard for people to make, not hard, it's harder for people to make a false allegation against somebody who they got to look in the eye. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. We call somebody, they said, I did that, let them say it to my face. You've heard that kind of statement before, right? Let them say it to my face. And the assumption is that if there's face to face, it's harder for someone to lie on us. Right to my face, say it to my face. Yeah, you did X. Okay, she said it to my face. You see? And he's saying, I ain't getting that. You're letting the kid testify in some conference room. Part of my right to confront witnesses is that she ought to be able to look me in the eye and say, I did it. And that ain't happening here. The court said again, listen, you don't have a right to a perfect confrontation, okay? You have a right to a confrontation, but it doesn't have to be perfect, and it's more than enough. And this was another example, okay, another example of the system leveling the playing field for kids, making the playing field more hospitable, more hospitable for children. And thus, they were more likely to get justice, right? In the case of Crandall, if this kid couldn't cut it in the courtroom, they'd probably dismiss the case. Now, we don't do a lot of this. DAGs, prosecutors, and it's easier to do. In this day, it was very, very technologically awkward to set up some whole system. Now you can do it with FaceTime. 
do it with a phone and a big screen. Real easy to do closed circuit. But it's still possible, and a few counties have done it in the past few years, it's still possible, and if a child is really traumatized by the person in the room, the courts of New Jersey have relaxed the Sixth Amendment, so to speak, when it comes to these kinds of cases. So those are the big four that level the playing field for kids. And there may be reference to some or all of these on the final as well. So you got any questions about how the courts level the playing field? K-A-W, it's really three of them with initials and one with a name. K-A-W, D-R-H, R-W, and Crandall. Those are your four cases. All right. Now, there's a... Um, There's a video that talks about forensic investigations and how to do an investigation of child maltreatment for you to look at. Um, this is a similar PowerPoint that I'm going to draft off of, but there's a narrated PowerPoint um, that you're supposed to watch in Learning Module 5. Okay. And these are just, although it's something that ought to take up a whole course, and there is a whole course on this, these are just little tricks and strategies for conducting a forensic interview. I mean, for conducting a, for an investigation into child maltreatment. I'm going to go over some of them, and then we'll pick up next week with the rest, the rest of... Um, the strategies. I just want to take a look at um, this learning module. Okay, so it's due the 31st, so it's a two-week module. So we have time uh, to go through here and begin today. All right. Now think about the Crandall case and all the cases we talked about, KW, RW, your readings in Professor Meyer's book. Every one of them involves some investigation into child maltreatment, especially child sexual abuse. And there was a time where we were just learning how to investigate these crimes on children, especially sexual abuse. We do a whole class on forensic interviewing of children. Some of you have taken that class already where we talk about the psychology of abuse, how victims respond to abuse, some of those things we touched on in this course. But all of those things are important because they help drive the investigation. The more we know about how child abuse works, especially sexual abuse, and how kids remember stuff, and how they're able to express themselves, and how families work, how institutions work, how people who have conflicted loyalties operate, the things that they do. The more we know about the social aspects of child maltreatment, the better prepared we are to conduct a thorough and competent investigation. So at its core, there's really a simple recipe for investigating crimes on children, and I'll talk a little bit about physical abuse in a while, but specifically sexual abuse. The simple recipe is what we call the fresh complaint, of course the child and the accused. At a minimum, those people need to be spoken to, and they should be spoken to on the day the child discloses, not tomorrow, not the next day, not next week on the day the child discloses. Every day that goes by undermines your investigation significantly. And I don't care if you're an intake worker or a prosecutor or a detective. If you want to find out the historical truth about what happened to a child, delay is your enemy. 
tomorrow is not good enough. So you want to have a me an immediate response. And at a minimum, you want to find out who the kid told and how they told, what they say happened to them, and what the accused has to say about it. Now, in doing that, you have to protect the integrity of what you learn while you're investigating the case. That's why you want to react immediately. And by protecting integrity, the integrity of the disclosure process, what I mean by that is you don't want witnesses to talk to one another. You really can't control that. So the best you can do is not give them an opportunity to talk to one another. And the way to do that is to respond immediately, to respond in a team fashion, have a team investigation, work collaboratively with the municipal police, prosecutors, detectives, and child protection, and interview people who are relevant to the investigation day one. Because then they can't go home and talk to one another and contaminate one another and influence other witnesses, most significantly the child or their siblings. Now that's the ideal. We can't do that in every case. But I'm telling you what the ideal is. Now, in most of the cases that come to law enforcement, specifically in, in our county, we do it in every case. But there are so many cases that child protection does, it's not feasible to respond immediately. Not respond immediately. In most cases, you do respond immediately. But talk to all of the relevant witnesses day one. That's a, that's a challenge. But if you want to maintain the integrity of the investigation and the disclosure process, you want to respond immediately. Now, it says up there you want to avoid Margaret Kelly Michael-like contamination. Whoop. I put MKM there. And that's one of the readings you have for today. <laughs> Margaret Kelly Michaels. And it's relevant to doing the investigation. Margaret Kelly Michaels was a 20-something from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania who came to Maplewood. She had a job at the We Care Daycare Center. And she was a teacher's aide there. One day a boy was at the pediatrician with his mother and he was having his temperature taken rectally. And he made a statement that startled his mother and surprised the pediatrician. He said something to the effect of, Miss Kelly does that to me. And upon further questioning, it was clear that he was saying that Miss Kelly put something in his butt because he was having his temperature taken through the butt, rectally, with a thermometer in his butt. And when they heard Miss Kelly does that to me, the mother concluded that this must be that teacher, Kelly, Kelly Michaels, that's his preschool teacher at the We Care Daycare Center in Maplewood. Well, a number of other kids had made similar kinds of disclosures. I think there were four in the beginning. And those kids were interviewed. And then later, Child Protection and the Essex County Prosecutor and law enforcement interviewed all of the kids that were in Margaret Kelly Michaels' class, every one of them. And we often do that in institutional abuse cases to this day, right? We have a known group that's made allegations or we have suspicions about. And then you talk to the other kids because they are at risk, right? Just like you go interview the siblings, Child Protection workers, Right? Not because they said anything happened, but because one of the children said something happened, we have to rule out abuse to the other kids. Right? In an institutional context, if five boys or four children in Ms. Kelly's class have made statements that they were sexually touched, then there was a reasonable obligation to interview all the other kids, and they did and dozens of children made accusations. Eventually, she was indicted on over 130 counts of sexual assault and sexual molestation. She went to trial, Miss Kelly Michaels, and she was convicted and sent to prison. While she was in prison, her attorneys appealed to the appellate division. As you know, the appellate division doesn't look at the case again. It doesn't decide the facts. The appellate division decides whether there were mistakes of law, right? That was one of your midterm questions. And they had to decide whether the judge in the Kelly Michaels trial made all the right decisions on the law. And one of the arguments that the defense lawyers made, which became a hot topic not only in Essex County and in New Jersey, but around the United States of America, was 
that the investigative questioning of the children was so coercive, was so suggestive, so leading, that it put ideas <coughs> in the children's heads, that they made statements of abuse when no abuse in fact happened, that their memories were distorted and corrupted by the dykes workers, by the police officers, and prosecutors' detectives who questioned them. And that these kids, who were all preschoolers, were vulnerable to being misled, and that their memories, while very persuasive, when you heard them say what happened, it was compelling, were not real memories at all, but the product of suggestive, leading, and coercive questions. And there's a whole body of research, appellate court, that says that this stuff can happen, that kids' memories can get distorted. Now, we look at this in more detail in the forensic interviewing class. But in order to understand why we need to protect the integrity of the information and ensure that we will do the best we can to make sure that there's not cross-contamination, and I'll tell you what that means in a moment, we need to understand what the court found so offensive in Kelly Michael. So you had all of these arguments being made by the defense lawyers about suggestibility, about the children's memories being corrupted. You had psychologists from around the country filing legal papers with the New Jersey Appellate Division and then later the Supreme Court agreeing with the defense lawyers. They call them amicus briefs. It simply means that somebody who's not involved in the case has an interest in the case and can add something to help. So you have people from Cornell University, University of Southern California, McGill University in Montreal, a lot of researchers and academics wrote legal papers to the appellate court and later the Supreme Court saying, yes, preschoolers' recollections can be easily corrupted or messed with or distorted or changed when people ask bad questions. So that was the central issue in the appellate court. Uh, in the appellate court in Kelly Michaels. And her conviction was reversed. The courts agreed. Not that she was innocent, but they agreed that these kids were questioned in a bad way. And when you take forensic interviewing, if you take it, you'll see the kinds of questions that they ask. You know, Miss Kelly's bad. We want to put her in jail. Don't you want to put Miss Kelly in jail? Well, the other kids want to help me put Miss Kelly in jail. Well, you can't stereotype somebody and say that they're bad, that they belong in jail and say that to a little kid, a little preschooler. Okay? They want to be like the other kids. They may want to agree with you that Kelly's bad. They may be primed to say bad things. And there were about a dozen different kinds of question types that were bad, that were asked by child protection and the prosecutor and the law enforcement, that had the potential to mess with the kids' memories. So it was reversed, and she was released. Then the case went to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court agreed with the appellate court. And they continued her release. And they said to the Essex County prosecutor, look, we didn't say she's innocent. You can try her again. But by then, the spirit was crushed. Nobody wanted to go back to court. It was almost a decade later. The kids were grown. Not grown, but they were a lot older now. And nobody had the heart to go back to court and try the case again. You know, and some people really had strong concerns about whether this woman was guilty or not. No one will ever know for sure. But the point is, is that the flow of information has the potential, and how that information is shared with the children has the potential to distort their memories. If we are suggestive to children, especially preschoolers, they may agree with our suggestions. They may adopt what we suggest to them as part of their memory process. So we want to react immediately. We want to interview the fresh complaint, the child, and the bad guy. Okay? The child needs to be interviewed on video in a sexual abuse case, at least when they're under 12. That's the ideal. Because then there's no question about whether the law enforcement or the child protection interview was bad or good. <coughs> it's very transparent. Anybody can watch it. And in New Jersey, we video record in every jurisdiction uh, allegations of sexual abuse that could result in criminal charges. When we work collaboratively, whether you're in Cape May County or Bergen County, when you work collaboratively with the prosecutor's office, those kids are video recorded. So now we know what the interview looks like. But before the kid's interviewed by 
law enforcement or child protection, somebody else has spoken to the kid. We call that person a fresh complaint. And that's the guidance counselor, the aunt, or the neighbor. You know, every kid told somebody, right, about what happened to them that got it to the authorities. Most children don't go to the police station and say, I was molested, right? Nearly all cases, kids get out some <coughs> other responsible person, and they call the cops or call diapers, right? That's your fresh complaint. The fresh complaint is the responsible adult or child, the, res the person that the child confided in about the abuse that brought it to the authorities' attention. Sometimes it's a playmate. <clears throat> Sometimes it's a teenage kid. Sometimes it's a 13-year-old boy who a kid discloses to. Many times it's a grown-up. Many times it's the guidance counselor or the child's aunt or a teacher or a school resource officer or even a child protection worker. <coughs> Sometimes child protection workers, DCP and P workers, go out on a physical abuse case. They may be talking to the child about potential physical abuse, and the child makes a disclosure of sexual abuse. Okay? In that case, the child protection worker is the fresh complaint. That's the first person that the child told that brought it to the authorities' attention. Okay? Now, you may find other fresh complaints. Supposing the child tells their guidance counselor, and she calls it into DIFUS, DIFUS calls it into law enforcement, there's a joint investigation launch. That child is 11 years old. You ask the child, is Mrs. Jones the DIFUS counselor, I mean the guidance counselor, to be the first person you told? No. Did you tell someone else in the past? Yes. Who are they? Who are they? I told my boyfriend, 11 years old, you have a boyfriend? Yes, I have a boyfriend. What's his name? Where does he live? I told my cousin, but I promised, she promised me she would never tell. I made her swear she would never tell anybody. Whoever the child told in the past about their victimization is also relevant. And they need to be spoken to as well. The fresh complaint witness is probably the most important witness in the entire child abuse investigation the most important. Next to the victim, it is the most important. And the reason is, is because it really gives us a window into the credibility of the accusation. When I first was asked to go to the child abuse unit 20 years ago, I struggled with this assignment. I wanted to keep trying murders and <coughs> robberies and, and those kinds of cases. I enjoyed them. I was successful at them. This stuff was very, very difficult. And, you know, uh, as many of you know, we work for child protection. I mean, we're dealing with the worst of the worst here. And the people who exploit and manipulate and batter and harm children you know, are society's most detestable people. And, you know, on the one hand, you have to deal with these kind of people. On the other hand, you have to make accusations against people. And what if you're wrong? That was my biggest thing. Like, what if I'm wrong, man? You can't be accused of anything more uh, despicable on this planet than molesting or harming a child. I mean, there's nothing worse. There's nothing that holds you up to more ridicule in society than taking advantage of a small creature, a little child. So what if you mess up? What if you get it wrong? I mean, there can't be anything more troubling than falsely or mistakenly accusing someone. So to give myself some comfort, I said, listen, i got to be pretty sure. And one way that I learned to be pretty sure was to look at who the kid told and how they told. When I say, when you talk to the fresh complaint, it gives you a window into the credibility of the accusation. What I mean is, when you talk to the person the child told, that gives me some peace of mind as to whether this child is telling the truth or not. Now, I'm not 100% certain. For example, the child, you interviewed the guidance counselor. Tell me what happened. She said, listen, I don't want to go home anymore. Um, 
My mother's brother came from Sicily, his name is Antonio, and he comes and touches me at night. And the child's crying. And she says, listen, I don't want to get him in trouble. I love Uncle Antonio, but I want him to stop touching me. Please don't tell my mom. Can you figure out a way to make this stop? Well, imagine somebody said that. I mean, that's a pretty credible disclosure to me. Because they were appropriately emotional when they said what happened. Okay. They made an accusation against somebody, but they were concerned about that person's well-being. They didn't want to see anything negative happen to that person. Right? So that makes it more credible. You know, when people make false accusations, almost always they're doing it for some advantage. There's got to be some end game. There's got to be some outcome, some reason why they're falsely accusing somebody. Okay? And in the hypothetical I just gave you, the child wants to protect the person. She wants to do everything but tell the authorities about this. So that's one way the child's disclosure, you know, I would consider to be uh, credible or believable. You want to look at how the child told, what they said, the words that they said, whether they thought they were in trouble for what they said. That's a pretty good indicator. I never wanted to tell anybody because I didn't want to get in trouble. But, well, how, if your grand uncle is molesting you or following your body parts, why would you get in trouble? You're never going to say that to the child, but the point is, if the child thinks they're in trouble or thinks that they're to blame, then they're making a statement against their own interests. And those statements are more believable than statements that are in their interest. You know, we got a letter today from some woman who reported that some priest tongue-kissed her 20 years ago. I've never seen anything like it. The last paragraph, it said, what kind of cash settlement can I get? What? <laughs> and I read where a boy got a cash settlement for a million dollars. And I don't want to see this happen to anybody else, but... Um, uh, I think I deserve a cash settlement. She must have used the word cash settlement four times. <laughs> and I've never seen anything like it. Now, that's an obvious one, right? Is there a motive? Mm -hmm. Exactly. There's a, there, there's this, you never see this. It may be implied. They may file a lawsuit. But this lady used those words for Pete's sake. I mean, we couldn't get any more motivated by money than that statement. Um, you know, in that case, you're skeptical, right? I mean, in that case, her motives are rather obvious. Again, it doesn't mean it didn't happen. I feel badly in a way, but first of all, you know, we're not going to prosecute a blindside tongue kissing it 20 years later. <laughs> because at most it's a harassment or an offensive touching. Um, so it's really not prosecutable. Um, but even if it were, sadly, she, she started babbling about cash settlement. She really hurt herself, if there was ever any case. And I doubt there's any case. But you want to look at the, who the child first told. You want to look at everything that that child said about what happened to them. You want to look at uh, every aspect of the disclosure. You know, and who might they have told? The guidance counselor, a playmate. Maybe there was a, have you ever heard of the CAP program? Yeah. Child Assault Prevention. Many programs come to the schools and they, they <laughs> teach children about boundaries and empowerment. And they're pretty good. And they're pretty non-suggestive. Yeah, well, unfortunately, they used to not tell us when they were in town. That was bad. <laughs> now they let us know when they're in town, so we can get ready. But yes, when they come to town, they, sh they shake the disclosure tree, and you get a lot of disclosures. So they, they may have been. So you do. You you want to find out what prompted the disclosure, what motivated the disclosure, and by doing that, you're almost always in a much better position to evaluate whether this is workable or not whether this is believable, whether this disclosure makes sense, whether the allegation makes sense. you got to talk to this fresh complaint. What prompted it? What was the witness doing or saying to the child just before the child disclosed? What were the child's exact words? If they don't remember the exact words, ask the person to paraphrase. You know, like, I don't remember exactly what they say, but it was something like this. It's okay for them to give you the gist what the child said. Okay? I'm going to give you an example. Two, two kinds of disclosures and show you how one is very problematic and one is a lot better. And these statements to the guidance counselor or the playmate, if the child's under 12, what the child said may be admissible in court. 
Most of the time what people say outside court is called hearsay, and you're not allowed to repeat it. The kid has to come in and say what happened. You really can't bring in the guidance counselor and say what the kid said. But if it's about sexual abuse and the kid's under 12 in New Jersey, the statement will come in. If it's trustworthy. So how do we size up trustworthiness? And where is the potential for the fresh complaint? Not DICUS or law enforcement or the prosecutor's detectives like in the Kelly Michaels case. But when kids make disclosures, you have to look at who got the disclosure. What was said? What were they doing? Was the mom washing dishes and the child tugged on her apron strings and said, Grandpa does this to me spontaneously? Well, spontaneous? Good. A lot of leading questions from, an, from a grandma or someone? Not so good. So imagine, I like to call this the Dr. Grandma case. I love grandmas. Grandmas are the best bit of salt in the earth. Lots of grandmas take care of lots of kids. Um, and um, if it weren't for grandmas, uh, we'd be in a much better, much worse place in society. Mm -hmm. But in my hypothetical, imagine that grandma is bathing. We've had these cases more than once. This is just from a real collection of cases over the years. Grandma is, is, is bathing three and a half year old Gabriella. <clears throat> and she's bathing Gabriella and she's washing her body and Gabriella's naked and she's squawking and squawking and making flash noises and they're having fun and she said as she's washing her vagina has someone been touching grandma's stuff huh ah. and grandma looks a little closer and she concludes she concludes that gabriella's vagina looks red redder than usual redder than it should be dr grandma has noticed some evidence of drama in her mind now she doesn't say it that way she just knows her vagina looks different she's there she doesn't say she's has someone been touching grandma's stuff no touching grandma's stuff has someone been touching grandma's stuff? Who touched grandma's stuff? Gabriella, I'm asking you, has someone been touching grandma's stuff? Touch grandma's stuff. Grandma has never liked her daughter's boyfriend. The most recent boyfriend, Gerard, can't stand him at all. In fact, she heard at the beauty shop that Gerard touched the kid when he lived in North Carolina. And one of the policemen that she knows from the Dunkin' Donuts, he said that the guy has a long history of drug use, although her daughter says no. But she heard it from the cop. He's a druggie. She knows he's a druggie. His eyes always look bloodshot. She don't like the guy. So she says to Gabriella, has Big Jerry, that's what the child calls, has Big Jerry been touching grandma's stuff? Huh? No. Big Jerry didn't touch grandma's stuff? Huh? Has Big Jerry touched your stuff? Big Jerry touched my stuff? Big Jerry touched your stuff? Huh? Yes! Big Jerry touched your stuff? Uh-huh. <laughs> now, this is very real. Take my word. Here's what happens, though. Now, you tell me, CPS worker, you tell me if you haven't seen this. We get the referral, right? The referral says this. Maternal grandmother reports that three-and-a-half-year-old Gabriela Vasilo reports that her uh, mother's boyfriend, Gerardo Priscilla, who has a history of child molestation in North Carolina and, and drug abuse, digitally penetrated her on multiple occasions. <laughs> hey, man, that may be true. <laughs> and that may be what grandma kind of pulled out of the child, but it ain't credible. It's problematic, right? It didn't come out spontaneously. The child, under my little hypothetical, really didn't say that. See, Grandma is biased. She's poised to think negatively about Jerry. And she should. I'm not saying she's wrong. Jerry's a bum. The whole daughter made a lot of bad decisions. Grandma's, grandma's on the right track here, but she's not the best person to do this interview. But she did. You ever have a witness who brings out and gets a Barbie doll or a stuffed bear or puts the bears and says, show Grandma what happened with the bears? That's not a credible accusation. I'm not saying we don't follow up on it. We do. You know? I know the kid. What were the child's exact words? See the last <clears throat> bullet point? It wasn't he digitally penetrating me. I'll tell you that. So when you debrief grandma, you've got to say, what happened? What was happening? What were you saying? What was she saying? What was going on? I want to hear, what well, someone touching grandma's stuff? Came my stuff? The best that the grandma can give you the gist of what happened, the better position we are in evaluating whether this is meaningful or not, whether it's credible or not. We know that preschoolers are the most vulnerable, they're the most difficult to interview, and the most, they have the most potential for having a, 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 
a recollection um, forced on that. But we, we guess what? The grandmas that come in that we ask them comprehensive questions, they'll tell us what they did. They're not hiding anything. But if we don't ask, we don't know. Now contrast that with Daniela. Daniela is she's hanging out with her aunt, her mother's sister, okay? and they're watching a program. They're watching some one of the Lifetime movies about Tom. <laughs> <laughs> and it's about incest. And Daniela starts to look down, and you know, and, and Aunt Cynthia knows something's wrong here. And she's like, Daniela, are you okay? No, I'm okay, Aunt Cynthia. Is there something you want to talk about? No, I see that you look like you're about to cry. What's going on? No, no, it's okay, it's okay. She drops it. The next day, Daniela, who's eight years old, goes to Aunt Cynthia and says, Remember that TV program? Mom's boyfriend, that new guy she sees, he does the same kind of things to me. But I don't want to get him in trouble because he's really nice to mom and she loves him. And I don't want, she really loves him. I don't want to see nothing bad happen to him, but he doesn't, and I want it to stop. First of all, I made her eight, eight roles of the most credible creatures on the planet, right? They're pretty good. They're, they're old enough to know and say, they're not old enough to be really corrupted by life and stuff. But even if she was five, the, the, the point is that the disclosure was spontaneous. She made a statement about not getting the guy in trouble. She just wanted to stop. You cannot ascribe any malicious motive to her statement. So those are kind of the polar opposites here. On the one hand, you got Dr. Grandma, who's very coercive, putting words in the child's mouth, who's highly biased, right? You don't like the guy. And then you got Aunt Cynthia, who's just the vessel through which the information flowed, and just says, okay, you don't want to talk about it, that's okay. The child's spontaneous. The child makes statements about not getting the guy in trouble, okay? So in between those two poles, you got all kinds of disclosures. So the one, number one thing you need to do, especially in sexual abuse cases, get a hold of who the child told before she came to the authorities. And if they told multiple people, you need to talk to them all. And you would hope that there's some general consistency, not complete consistency. Complete consistency is the mark of a liar. People are not robots. They don't remember things the same way every time they tell it. So if a kid is very mechanical and tells it exactly the same way all the time, your antenna ought to go up and go, I don't know about this one. So they ought to be a little bit different, but the gist of what they reported across people. They told their boyfriend, and then later the guidance counselor, and then they told the child protection worker, and then later they made a forensic interview. Those four tellings ought to be generally consistent, right? So what was the person doing before? I was dating the child. I was watching the movie on Lifetime. What was happening immediately before the disclosure? Who was there? What were the exact words? Some of them been messing with grandma's stuff. Use quotations. Okay. Well, I don't remember exactly what I said. Well, what was the gist of what you said? Just give me the, a sense of what you said, okay? Rather than, she told me he put his finger inside her. Was that what she said? No, not quite. Well, give me the gist. Oh, she said he was messing with her or got fresh with her or something like that. He had his hands all over her. I, I don't remember, but something like that. But thank you. You know, because we want to see if the child's using her own words. The more age inappropriate the child's words, the less believable the statement, right? And now and then we do get a kid who says you always digitally penetrated. We get a lot of these. Why are you, you tell me why you're here today? With the older kids, some of them eight and above. Because I was raped. <coughs> okay. You're raped. What makes you say that? Now what you need to do is we call this check for definition. Lots of kids need different things when they say rape. I, I, I want to know what you mean when you say rape. Tell me what happened. And I'm telling you, and, and you veteran CBS workers know this, in about 90% of the time, it wasn't rape at all. It was sex, you all. But it wasn't forcible penile penetration, which is um, in the vagina. It wasn't forced intercourse. And, you know, we kind of don't like it when they use the word rape because we're worried a little bit that somebody prompted them or put ideas in their head. It's not the worst thing in the world. And we get lots of kids who use that term. Um, and when they do use that term, uh, even though they used it, and it's a little age-inappropriate, you want to find out what they mean by that. 
And if they say something like, he put his mouth on my mouth and stuck his tongue in my mouth, it, it's almost so innocent that you've rehabilitated her now. It shows an innocent understanding of rape. Okay? So we need to pay attention to the child's exact words because the child's exact words can give us insight into the, whether the child's being um, honest or not. And the kids have a tough time pulling off the big lie. You also want to know how the witness reacted to the disclosure. Supposing Dr. Grandma goes, oh my God, he's got to go to jail. That big Jerry belongs in jail. He touched Grandma's stuff. Damn, and I'm going to give my daughter a whooping. Your mom is going to get a whooping. Well, if that was said, we want to know that. Why do you want to know that? Somebody's going to interview that child again. Maybe you, maybe a forensic interviewer. Why would we want to know how the witness reacted? Exactly. It might turn her off from saying anything in the future. And we want to know that. And we can address that in the interview. You know? Because if they clam up on us and say, listen, um, we told Grandma what happened. Is there a reason that you, you don't want to talk today? Are you worried about something? You know, sometimes kids think they're in trouble or they're going to get their mom in trouble or someone else. How are you feeling? If you give them a little carrot, they'll come and go, I don't want my mom to get in trouble. Well, your mom's not in no trouble with us. And your mom didn't do anything wrong. We just want to make sure you're safe. You know, a little, uh, a little attention, a little um, letting them know that they're okay, they didn't do anything wrong, can go a long way with these kids. A long way. So, but we, don't, we need to know that by finding out how the witness reacted to the disclosure and what they said or did. Sometimes they'll say, oh no, I didn't let her hear anything. Okay, uh, what did you do next? I called my sister. Okay, so Grandma called her sister. Well, where was Danielle when you did that? She was in the TV room watching SpongeBob. Where were you? In the kitchen. How far away is that? About four feet. And what did you say to your sister? I said, I'm going to kick that big Jerry's ass. I can't wait. Call the cops. Call the cops. They mess with my baby. They mess with my baby. You need to know that. Right? You need to know that. Just because you told I was in the other room, find out where the other room is. You know, if she, rest assured, if she can't stand Big Jerry, and she called from the kitchen on a phone, the kid heard it. The kid heard it. And we can make that assumption. Now, she says, I, I, put the, I took the little girl and put her with the relatives down the hall. That's nice to know, right? That's nice to know. So you need to find out all this information. One witness I've been talking about, just one witness, is so critical to the case. The kid, and next is the fresh complaint. And the third one was who before? The bad guy, right? The bad guy. So when we come back next week, we'll look at the rest of the people that we need to thoroughly debrief and question when you're doing one of these kinds of investigations. Yes, it's actually a narrated power. Not this exact one, but this same slides. It looks a little bit different. It's not black and white. It's blue, green and white. Yes, but what I just talked about with you, 